Cool. All right. So we hit record as always. So that's that's uh, us delivering on the promise of giving you guys the recording if you want it. Uh, but Kevin, welcome. We're going to get into our quick podcast intro in just a second. But before we do so, just wanted uh, you to say hi uh, quickly to the group. Hey, Kevin, good to see you. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Super excited. Awesome. Thanks a lot for joining us, Kevin. And Kevin and I spoke this morning. He's a really energetic guy, full of ideas. I think you're going to be inspired by his story. All right, Vadim, are we ready to go on the podcast recording? Always ready. Born ready, Sergey. Born, right. I don't know about born ready. We just started this podcast two years ago. We just learned it ourselves. Actually, Kevin has a, a great podcast that was on. What, what's your podcast called, Kevin? Digital Marketing Fastlane. Digital Marketing Fastlane. Vadim, maybe you can drop it in the chat um, while we get started here. But folks, check out Kevin's podcast as well after you're done with this. If you're interested in marketing um, and getting deep dive into it, he has some amazing guests, but he also is just a wealth of knowledge himself. So we're dropping it in the chat right now so that you get the link and you can um, check it out for yourself. But I, we're actually excited to get on Kevin's show as well in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Kevin, for having us as well. All right. Awesome. We're just about ready here to get started. Vadim's dropping the link. Excellent. All righty. Cool. You ready, Sergey? Yes. Yes, sir. Let's do it. Hello and welcome back to The Mentors. Mentors. This is Vadim and Sergey, and you're listening to a show where we interview founders and creators that started off potentially with nothing, but then were able to turn their skills and build their network to take their businesses off the ground. And today we're excited to bring you this podcast episode as part of a live podcast recording in front of an audience here over Zoom uh, as part of School 16, one of our weekly seminars that we host every week at 6 p.m. We're excited to bring to you our conversation with Kevin Urtia, founder of Voy Media, among many other startups and ventures. Kevin is a serial entrepreneur in every definition of the word. He's been starting companies for a long time. And part of the reason why we're excited to bring you this episode and this conversation is because Kevin has really taken his career into his own hands. He started off as an engineer, took all the skills he learned to launch his own businesses, and then transitioned that to an expertise in marketing. So we want to hear the exact story from the early days of how you got started, Kevin, to where you are today, uh, running Void Media, among those many other companies. So I want to take it back to the early days when you decided to study computer science uh, in college. And I want to hear a little bit about how you decided to study it and what you thought you were going to do with it, because I think you started putting into practice your learnings right away while in school, which many people don't. So tell us about how that, how that started off for you in school. Yeah. So how I, st Hey guys, thanks for having me. So how I started, I guess, computer science or programming in general was that growing up, I was really big into gaming. So there was this game I used to play called secrets of war. It was text-based game where you can just like you know collect gold essentially you could go on this map and then just do stuff and i was just like oh wow this is a pretty cool game like and i contacted the developer and i was like hey like how did you make this thing and then he's like oh I, I did like um dot net was the thing back then uh like the microsoft one and i was like oh this is cool like i never heard of this thing programming um so then i picked up like a i went to a book i got like a html for dummies book and that's how I thought that was programming back then. And then I was just like, eventually I was like, this is not programming, programming because HTML, there's no logic. So that's technically not programming. It's just like structure code. Uh, so that's kind of how I was like into, got into like sort of programming. And then I picked up like a C, C++ book. And I was just like, whoa, this is so complicated. And I, by this time, my parents, they, they came from like El Salvador. And they're like, oh, I want to do programming. And they're like, no, you're not playing games all day long for your life. And I was like, no, programming isn't just games. Like you can make games because like they, that's all they saw me doing. But I was like seeing it, like you can just make stuff. And that's sort of like what got me excited. So that's essentially kind of how I thought about programming because I didn't even know what else to do. I was like, oh, I love this game thing. I love this programming that I'm learning HTML. Um, I kind of want to do it. And, and that was exciting. So then I went to college, uh, Binghamton for computer science for that because I thought that was what like the staff was like Googling. I was like, oh, like, what do you do with like programming? What degree do you need to get for that? Um, but that was programming. But at that time, I really, th I really wanted to do programming because at that time I was reading a lot of TechCrunch, TechMeme, all like the startup blogs, like Dig. I was looking at Dig. I was like, whoa, this thing is crazy. Like, how is this Dig company making so much money? I was just like, this is like, uh, like a bookmarking company. And I was just like, I don't, that's sort of what got me curious. To, like programming was more like just seeing the products and then being like, oh, I don't think it's that hard to make. Like, how come these people are doing it? Like, what are they doing exactly to make this thing? And that really what led me into like, 
just learning about programming and keep reading about startups and tech. And I was like, where are people getting all this funding from? What is that? And that sort of really manifested into like learning like web dev, web programming, because I was when I was at college at that time, we we're doing a lot of like Java, C++. And I was like, this isn't what the cool people are doing. Like no one's talking about Java or C, like this is boring. And then I was telling you before, I was like, I got to learn what they're doing. And I was like, at that time, Twitter came up and I was like, oh my God, like Twitter is crazy because when Twitter first came out, I was using it as a group text messaging app because it was going to your phone. And then all my friends, all our friends who only had Twitter, we only followed each other. And then you could send each other the messages. And then we're just like te texting each other essentially through Twitter because there's no group texting app like GroupMe back then. So we're just like, oh, this is cool. And I was like looking at how you do this. And I was like, oh, what's this Ruby thing? And then I was just like, oh, like Ruby on Rails. I was like, oh, DHH, like David Hanneman High School. I was like, oh, I think I'll learn this thing. I was like, this is so cool. This is so easy to make. And that was like what kind of really got me into programming because then I was like, whoa, like it's actually not that hard compared to like the programming that we're doing in school, like making all those like GUI apps. I was like, this is so complicated. I don't want to be doing GUIs in Java. This is like crazy. Like swing. I was like, I hate swing. I was like, I don't want to be doing that anymore. Uh, and then that's kind of like what led me to just learn programming uh, as in like web dev, because in college at Binghamton at the time, no one was teaching web dev. And I was like, and I was just Googling, like the, I would tell people like, I was going like I'm back then, like net tuts was really big. Uh, Net tutorials, I think it was called. And just like they had like tutorials on how to make stuff. And that goes doing Twitter apps. I was doing like phone apps, phone books, like very simple like stuff. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then that ultimately leads to like, you realize Ruby's a thing. And then you're like, okay, I actually got to learn HTML. Okay, I got to learn CSS. I got to learn JavaScript. And I was like, oh my God, there's so much to learn. And I was just like, okay, this is so cool because like it's like fueling this thing of like, oh, now I can make my own thing. And that then led me in college to also do graphic design because I was like, oh, I realized I got to learn design. So then I was like doing graphic design in college and actually became like a TA for like graphic designers. And I was like, oh, okay, this is cool because I need design to program myself because then if not, it looks really bad. Yeah. Um, so that sort of like led me into this sort of path of doing stuff. But at the same time, I was still like reading like TechCrunch, uh, all that stuff. And I was like, oh God, I gotta go to Silicon Valley because like everybody's raising money there. This is like where everybody is. And I was telling you before, like uh, that ultimately led me to uh, do an internship in New York City for this company called ERA, which is like an incubator in New York back then. It's still an incubator right now, but uh, that sort of led me to like the startup thing. And there I was like really like more cemented what I wanted to do because at that time I was like the intern for programming. I was working at this company called Buzztable, but then we had like VCs come in and like talk to us about stuff. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. Like I saw Fred Wilson. I was like following his blog for a long time. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Like Fred Wilson, like I follow this guy for so long. I've never met him. And it's like so cool that like, I'm like 20, 20 here meeting him. And I was like, that's so exciting. Uh, so that led me to like doing all this stuff, going to all these startup events. Um, I don't know. It just like led me to doing startup weekends, startup hackathons. Uh, I was doing like the 48 hour. Th I mean, I don't know if people do it anymore, but like back then, like 48 hour coding binge, you're just like sleeping at the place. I was like, oh, this is so fun. Like meeting with other people programming. I did it in Binghamton. I did it in uh, New York City. I also, when I moved to California, I also did it in, in Cali California as well, because I was like, this is the thing we're doing. But Sorry, that's like a lot. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it actually, it, and it, the thread that I'm already yeah. noticing through this this quick spiel about your college experience is that you just followed your own personal curiosity, and then you, you yeah. dropped a couple of uh, different words there. But yeah, Java and C++ is like the foundational object-oriented programming yeah. that they teach you in school because it's so fundamental to everything else. But if you're doing web development, yeah, Ruby on Rails, learning JavaScript, HTML, CSS, those are the fu fu fundamental web development type of frameworks. Um, but I'm curious, you know, you were learning all these things, you were diving into yeah. web development, you were diving into a little bit of graphic design so you could actually create websites that look decent. Um, and then you started a web development shop to make some money while still in college. You have a yeah. really cool story about how you got customers oh, yeah. for that first business that you had. How did you get customers? So for that, so our company is called at, at that time, like me and Wilson, uh, we're like, oh, let's name it one tiny bit. So it's like one tiny bit.com or like a bit for like programming where it's like, oh, this is clever. So that's what we named it. And then we had a website up and we're like, okay, we need to find clients. And of course we like ask people, but like, I was like, oh, Craigslist, there's always people on Craigslist looking for things. So at that time, Craigslist was not as strict that it is now where like they're detecting scrapers or programming bots. So what we did was I just created a scraper that went to like the web design or web dev section. And then every time I saw a new listing, um, I would send them an email through Gmail. By that time, the Gmail API was very easy. Like, but right now it's so strict with like security. Um, back then, all you needed to do was like um, just getting your, your email 
um, username and their email password through a Ruby program. And then you can send out emails as if it was a personal emails. Um, so yeah, it's funny because I looked back at my own email and I was like, Oh yeah, I still have these emails. I was like, this is so crazy. Like I didn't, I still use my Kevin email that still worked back then. And I still get these, e and I sent these emails out all programmatically. And basically I would just like, at that time, I didn't really know about like scheduling emails or scheduling jobs. So I would just like in my terminal, just be like, oh, let me run the job real quick and like check if there's any new emails that have been like fetched. And I would just like store the ID in case there was a new old, old one that way I didn't send it again. Um, but that's how I did it. And like, I just got a ton of replies that way. And like, not a lot, but like it was enough where I'm like, oh, people are actually responding. And then that led me to like learn about, I mean, back then I didn't know what all this was. And I realized it was like cold outreach essentially, or like cold sales or just like, figuring out pricing. I was just like, this is just like, how do you get this for me? It was like, this is how you just get business. And it wasn't like a, there was no strategy or like right now I read the books. I was like, Oh, that's what that strategy is called. Um, it's just, for me, it was just like, I got to find clients somehow. Um, but then like that taught me to like meet with people. And I was like, I remember like in college, um, someone wanted to meet with us and I was like, Oh yeah, like we're actually at Binghamton. Can you come to like our university? Because like, I don't like, I don't, I'm not, you're not coming to my apartment. This is like really weird. Like <laughs> you're like a much older person. Uh, but that's kind of how we were doing it. And then uh, eventually we made like iPhone apps, we made web apps and we made like some real estate apps. Uh, some like, we made this thing called like community key for like Binghamton students that, uh, somebody we knew in the, in the school wanted us to build. Um, so we were doing that. And then it's so funny because we also hired somebody to work for us while we were in college. And he was also in high school. His name was Justin and he actually works at Facebook now. We're still good friends. But at that time we're just like, I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did this stuff. And I was like 19 or 20. I was like, not even thinking about it. I was just like, Oh, I just need help. And like, I was like, Oh, I know this kid's really smart. Like, let me figure out how much we can pay him. And then let me double that. And I was like, Oh, this is a great deal for me. Cause I don't do the work. I'm just like a PM. And I realized that's like, that's actually much more hard. That's harder because like I'm communicating between like two people. And I'm just like, Justin, just say you work for us and just like, say like you're not a contractor. So that way it's easier to communicate with the client. Um, so there's like a bunch of like stuff that just like, we just did. And it's like, there was no rhyme or reason. We're just like, oh, this is a just next logical step. Well, you know, I think this is the perfect example of ask for forgiveness. And yeah. clearly you're the type of person that just likes to experiment and see if it works out. If it doesn't probably try something else. But I'm curious, you know, at this point, uh, you just like to tinker, you did your own thing. Um, and it makes sense that you would do these experimental things. You started this web dev shop. You figured out how to get customers without necessarily knowing that there was probably like a sales funnel that you yeah. were working through, that there might be a pitch that's involved in closing the deal. You were just kind of trying things out and doing it in a very scrappy, hacky way. But uh, I know that eventually when you moved to California, you joined mint.com and eventually it was acquired by Intuit. So there was at some point in your career where you had to get into these highly structured environments where you probably weren't allowed to just kind of do yeah. your thing all the time. So how did that feel when you had to be a software developer, web developer in a more strict environment? Yeah, this is a, a great question because people always ask me this. Uh, when I was at Mint, um, I went to Mint because my old boss, his name was like uh, Xi'an, and he was a really good JavaScript developer. So when I went to work with him, I was like, oh, I'm going to learn so much because I was like learning JavaScript. And back then, um, jQuery by John Resig, I think, first came out. And I was like, whoa, jQuery is so easy. By that time, I was like doing raw JavaScript stuff. And then when jQuery came out, I was like, whoa, like animations, uh, slideshows, all this stuff was so easy to make with jQuery. And, and then I was like, oh, I want to learn more jQuery. At that time, I got really big into like, like learning how that worked. And I was like, then my boss at, that was going to work at Mint, he was like a big JavaScript guy. And I was like, oh, I'm going to learn so much because at that time Mint was moving into like a single SPA, single page application, right? For JavaScript. So like no refreshing, no loading, all that nice stuff that you see now. Before it was like kind of like refreshing. Um, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to learn so much. But like within like the first month that I got to Mint, I always tell people like, I knew I didn't like it there because exactly kind of what you said. It's like way too structured for me. I was like, this is crazy. Like this is not like the startup stuff I thought it was going to be. Um, and I always tell people like, Honestly, like I told you, within the first like few weeks, I knew it wasn't for me. Um, Mint was a great company, great place to work. I was like, this would be great if I was like 40, 50 plus, like, because it's so structured. It was very nine to five. Like we would have like standups and like, I remember our boss telling us like, yeah, you're like only, you're only supposed to hour about three to four hours that you're supposed to work a day. And I was like, what? This is, we work nine to five, like three hours a day. That's like the max that you think we can work. I was like, this is crazy. And then like, I didn't realize why we just had so many meetings of like stuff that we were talking about projects. And I guess it makes sense uh, looking back, but I was just like, whoa, this is crazy. And 
at that time, I just graduated college. And I just left to California. Like I didn't know anybody. Um, I literally never left New York until I went to California for the first time. And I was like, oh, I'm going to live here and didn't know anybody. But I knew like, I was like, I didn't come to California for this. So I was like, this is like not what I came for. And everybody was like, you obviously ask your friends, your family, like, oh, just stay there for two years. And you know, that time on advice, like, and then you go somewhere else. And I was just like, nah, this is not how I work. I was like, I cannot stay here for two years. I'm just going to be like so depressed. And then within like six, eight months, I told my boss, I was like, hey, like I'm leaving. And by the time my boss had hired me to also left to start his own company. So I was just like, hey, like, I just like, what I came for is not even here. And then like the true experience is not what I figured. And then that's when I left to work another startup in San Francisco. Um, Cause that's where he's living. And my uh, mint was like in Mountain View like next to Google. So then I was like doing like kind of that like reverse commute. Um, and then my new job uh, was like a 10 minute walk. And I was like, yeah, like this is so much better. <laughs> and then that was like the true startup experience where it's like, we're just like working all the time and like hustling, trying to figure this stuff out. Um, but I mean, like for me, I always tell people like, I just like kind of do what I want. I was like, Hey, like I knew I wasn't going to like it within a month. I think anybody knows if you like something within a month or so, like any kind of relationships or just things in general. Um, it's kind of like, sometimes it would just prolong that. And then you get upset or angry. I'm just like, Hey, just make the decision now. Just like, I was so much happier. I was like, yeah, this is like the best decision I ever possibly made. Um, because that led me to more opportunities. Yeah. Well, and you, you use the time before that and in between these jobs to really build out your skill set. You were doing hackathons in the weekend. So you had a skill set that was marketable. And I think you, you had options because of that. But, you know, talk about what you did on the side, because you went and joined the smaller startup after Mint. But then you ended up starting, I mean, you were starting different projects on the side. But talk about how you ended up choosing which project to really dive deep into and turn into a business. How did you, how did you go about the yeah. process of finding that? Yeah, I think what you said is a good point. Uh, because at that time I was like really reading all this stuff like, Hey, if you fail, that's fine. You'll still find a job. So I was really into that like mantra of like, just make stuff because I still think that's interesting enough that shows that you have some sort of like drive. And that really showed me that really made me think like, Oh, let me just make, make stuff. Because when I would talk to, right when I moved to California, when I left there and I moved there, I was like, whoa, like everybody's like me. Like we're all just building stuff on the weekends, trying to make something work. And it was just like the common thing that we all did. And versus when I was like in school in Binghamton, I would tell people like, oh, I'm building stuff. They're like, why? Let's go out. And I was just like, oh, I don't know. I just kind of want to make stuff. So it was like very not like encouraging um, to like do that stuff. But when I went to California, it was like, it was like, whoa, like I'm so behind. Like everybody's doing things. Like I got to move faster. Sometimes I tell people like go to where, you know, you're going to just become better uh, versus like sometimes being at home. It's like, you don't really get the encouragement you need because like people don't know what's going on. So sometimes it's best to just move out and just be like, Hey, let me just do what I think will be best. Um, but building on, but yeah, building on that, like when I went to Zarly, which is a startup, I was there for about a year and a half too. Uh, there really, it was really a good culture of my old boss there. His name is Ian Hunter. I'm still friends with him. We talked like almost every day. He was really into like hacking on weekends and making stuff. So that really was a great culture to sort of see like, oh, this is great. Like he also still wants to hack on random projects. Like we would hack on like random Ruby gems, would hack on random stuff. Even my old other boss, we would just like go at night, we just like build stuff together. That wasn't really company related. So that really also uh, made me excited about the things that I want to be doing because I was like, oh, this led me to just like work on stuff. And when I was in California, I was building this thing called Madeline Rosa, which at the time, I guess at that time I just finished reading, um, what was that book by Eric Reese? It was like a uh, lean startup, lean startup. Yeah. I just finished reading that. And then he's like, Oh, you got to go talk to your customers and then, or talk to like the people that you're thinking of the business for. And I remember me and Wilson, cause me and Wilson were building it. We went to talk to flower shops. We're like, Hey, like, do you think it'd be cool if like if we give you orders and then we like deliver them like on demand by this time, like Uber was kind of just for starting Lyft was for starting. And I was like, it was like, it's kind of like on-demand flower delivery. And that's sort of what we thought of when we were doing. And we did it for a little bit. And then that's kind of like, that's kind of like where we built the whole website. It's like, if you go to like the Wayback Machine, you can still see it. It's like flower on-demand delivery. And that's when I kind of started thinking about like SEO because I was like, oh, like flowers in Hype Valley, flowers in Soma. And I was like, oh, I got to make separate what's up? Wait, wait, what pages for that? And then that's like what kind of made me to like think about like SEO and marketing um, in a sense because when I was at Zarly, I was kind of doing a lot of marketing for their team, just like the technical side of it. And so that kind of, that also kind of opened up my eyes to be like, whoa, like there's these marketers are doing marketing, but they don't really know how to like implement a lot of this marketing tech stuff. I was like, that's interesting to me. I was just like, I'm like, for me, I'm just like, shouldn't you know that? That was like kind of my thinking. Right. And so that's kind of like made me be like, Hey, like what if I learn marketing and I know the tech side, I think maybe that'll make me more dangerous, dangerous just because I know more. Um, and that's the way I always think about things like, Oh, like, why can I maybe do that? 
Uh, but that's kind of like, that's sort of like how I did things and thought about it. Um, so I did that one. And then we did another like kind of like HelloFresh competitor that we made the website. But again, we were just so, we were so big into at that time, like building product but not truly knowing how to get customers or how to get people to come to your website. We were just really great at just like thinking of these ideas and building them out, building them out versus like when we let lean startups, like who are your true customers? And that sort of came through time as we built more and we're trying to figure out who our, who, who our buyers are. Um, and at that time led us to learn about SEO. Um, we were diving into all of these forums, like what is SEO? How do you get free traffic? What is PPC, right? All this stuff that kind of led us to things. And, and then, um, a big one was when we went to like startup weekend in San Francisco called, called so solo mo social local mobile. By that time, this was like maybe t- like five, six years ago, like mobile wasn't as big as now. And we built like a four square type of competitor where we like, get like local recommendations and we won the event, which is so cool because the first time I won after like competing so much and and our team was like, at that time, our team was like 10 people. And like, after we won, everyone's like, oh my God, I'm going to build a company. Like, we're all going to build it together. And then within like a week, like half the people were like dropped off because everybody got busy, you know? And then the rest of the team, uh, we got free tickets to go to San Diego, which is awesome because I've never been there. And I remember, we, I remember we went to the Gaslight District. And I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. And I was like, I want to go to, I want to, I want to live to San Diego again because it was so awesome. Um, but we pitched call Ventures and they're asking us all this stuff. Like, how are you getting customers? What's your idea? I was like, uh, we, did, like, we didn't know. And, and uh, yeah, so that sort of like led me to like, just be like, oh, I got I think I had to learn marketing now, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting, uh, just gonna pack a few things here. First of all, folks, uh, some terminology, SEO, search engine <laughs> optimization, PPC, pay-per-click. Uh, some of the stuff you talked about, one of the concepts, which is the technical side of marketing. One term for that is engineering as marketing. It's become an increasingly um, important function in tech in general. It's also why there's a lot of no code or low code solutions yeah. now like Webflow that let marketing teams build this stuff themselves because they don't want to use engineering and technical resources to get these things off the ground. But um, it's, it's kind of funny because you know, you're talking about this stuff somewhat informal, like, oh yeah, we pitched this idea, we want yeah. to pitch. Oh yeah, okay, we got in front of Qualcomm Ventures and pitched the startups and kind of figured out, oh, maybe we don't know exactly how to pitch effectively or maybe we don't yeah. have the correct messaging for them in terms of what our customer acquisition strategy is. But still, you didn't fear that at all. It sounds like you just kind of went out and did it and um, iterated on your process after that. So I'm curious, you know, you, it's, it sounds like you were working on a lot of different ideas. And you had this flower concept um, that was kind of working, or at least people were excited about. But after that experience, you know, and, and generally, at what point did you decide to leave your full-time role at that startup and start your next venture? And what was that venture for you that actually started getting significant traction? You've had some traction with other companies at this point, your web dev shop, generally other stuff and projects you've been working on. But what was the first venture that actually put a dent in the wallet, if you will? Yeah. So after about a year and a half, two I was kind of getting just like, kind of like, I was like, oh, I kind of want to go back home. I was like, I was obviously, all my family was in New York. <clears throat> I have like three brothers. I have a brother, two sisters, and my mom was all here. And I was like, I really want to go back. Like, I don't really see them as much. And I guess like that just like home feeling. And I was like, I live, I'm from New York, but I never lived in New York City. I really want that experience. And I was like, I was like maybe 25 at that time, 26. Uh, I was like, I want to go back home. So I told the company, I was like, hey, I'm leaving. And at the time, like a bunch of stuff, the company was like kind of like not doing as well as it, as it, as I thought it would. So a lot of people were kind of leaving as well. So it's kind of like, it's like anything. It's like the right time, the right sort of feelings. It's sort of everything just happens kind of at once. Um, and then I left. Um, but then really when I was working at Zarly, um, Zarly, you think about it, it's kind of like an Angie's List slash competitor where it's like for local services. Mm-hmm. And at the time, like I said before, I was working on a lot of their marketing stuff, but like any startup, we're kind of like switching roles and switching stuff. So I was also working on like the checkout flow, um, all this stuff for sort of like consumers, thinking about the marketing. Um, I did a lot of SEO at Zarly towards my end of my time, because at the time I was like really talking to Bo, who's the CEO there. I was like, oh, I think we need like marketing. I was like, I don't know if we have anybody that's dedicated. And we did, but it was like a contractor type of person. And I was like, I really think that we need like a dedicated person. I was like, can you like, he was an awesome guy. He was like, Hey, yeah, just try it. Like, I don't, he's like, you can, I think you'll figure it out. Right. Which is sort of how I always tell people, Hey, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll read stuff. Um, so I was kind of doing that. But anyways, when I was working the checkout flow, we at the time we got access to all the data to sort of see like payments coming in. And I was like, Oh wow. Like these made come, these made like businesses or like people were like always getting jobs on our platform. Um, and like something we saw through the customer messages was that like after a certain amount of time, 
um, they just couldn't take any more jobs because they were just like booked. Because like when you find a good maid, like anybody knows, it's people request them all the time. Like, hey, can you always come back every Monday at like 2 p.m.? And then that sort of like takes up the time of the person. And for me, I was like reading all this stuff and I think I read um, um, The E-Myth, right? And I was like thinking about it. I was like, I read The E-Myth. That was a great book. I always tell people it's my favorite book. Uh, it was like the practitioners and then like the people that build companies are kind of like two different people where like you have a baker and then you have like the bakery. It's like a business versus the baker. Sometimes they get confused where they don't see a but beyond the uh, just like the company. And then, so for me, it's like, Oh, this is like the maids of that company. They don't see themselves as like owning the company because they just want to, their, their practice is doing the cleaning. Um, so I was like thinking about that. And I was like, when I left, I was like, Oh, I think like, I remember that company was making money. And I did like some, at that time I did some like keyword research as well on Google. And I was like, Oh wow, there's so much demand for, um, cleaning in New York city. I was in New York city is tons of apartments. And and I was looking at through the competition in the space through like the Google SEO. And I was like, oh, they all require you to, <coughs> to book, to call and be like book an appointment. And then someone goes in and inspects your home and then says, oh, based on your apartment size, we're going to charge, you, you know, 125. And like, I was like, oh, like, I think it'd be easier if people just book online and just sort of give them like a rant, like a range of price. That's okay. And that is sort of where we came in and then we made mate sailors. Um, so that was a company I made. And that's how we distinguish ourselves in the market because we were like, Hey, we want to keep the overhead low, low because I don't want to be going to apartments and saying like, yeah, like this is going to be 125 and they're going to be like, Oh, that's too much. And I was like, it's just wasted a day. Right. Mm -hmm. I rested an MTA card. I was like, I don't want to do that. So I was like, let me just do that sort of, we call it flat rate pricing. It's still what we have right now on the website. It still works. And if you look at the maid space right now in, in New York city, everybody's like this pricing, like everybody has like our pricing model and the way we structured things, which is kind of funny to look at. Uh, but that's how it was. And at the time it didn't make sense. Um, there was a lot of like pushback that we got because maids were like, Hey, that studio was not a studio. That's like, was a massive a place. Cause obviously, you know, some rich people have like massive studios, right? So it's like, <laughs> that's not a studio. Uh, but then again, but then some places were like studio was really small. So then I would tell the cleaners like, but you didn't call me and tell me, Hey, charge a customer less because that studio is smaller. Right. And then, so then they're like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Right. So it's like, you learn like things, right. Like that. Um, but that really helped us, uh, with that. Um, anyways, at that company, Mate Sellers, at that time, um, local SEO wasn't as big as it is now. So probably everybody, everybody knows now when you go to Google Maps and you like type in like donuts, right? That was a new thing back then. You weren't doing that because Google Maps was more for like driving directions. There was no businesses on there. So I was like reading a lot about local SEO and like Moz was like the Bible back then. I was like reading that every single day. People like, oh, you got to do Google My Business. You got to do that. And, that's, and I got really good at doing that. And then that's when like, we started doing implementing all the optimizations, all the tricks, all the all the, like schema tags, and then mate servers we got to like top three on Google. Um, even now, if you look at like home cleaning NYC or mate service NYC, we're like top three. So we've stuck on there for years. But that was through that time I was looking up marketing things, and I was like, oh, how do I implement these things? Because I was looking at like free traffic sites or tree traffic sources, or and SEO was like the one I kind of thought about. Um, and at that time, handy.com was a big competitor and they were just like spending a ton of money on PPC. And I was like, oh, I can't compete with this. How do I compete with them in a different way? And for me, it was like SEO. Um, so that's kind of how that, that started uh, Mate Sellers. So right now, Mate Sellers, we're in Boston, Chicago, New Jersey, and of course, Brooklyn. And we have like over 150 maids, they're all employees. I have like 10 operations people. And then we've acquired three other cleaning companies as well in New York City. Wow. That's awesome. I love how you started that business. You found a niche in a, in a marketing strategy, local search engine optimization that was untapped. And that's how you competed with companies like Handy, which by the way, raised, I think probably like, I think 50 or $60 million. And they ended up burning through all the cash uh, by paying for ridiculous customer acquisition campaigns so to expensive. the point where they couldn't pay their employees and they had to shut down. Whereas you, uh, you didn't raise any capital for this, for this no. mate company, did you? And no, no. Can you talk about how much revenue you got to with that business? Yeah. So with mate sellers, we're doing over like $3 million a year. Uh, it's just so much money. Um, because at the same time, a lot of the cleaning, which is great. So one thing I learned from uh, when I was working at Zarly was this recurring thing. I was like, oh, wow. Why do people keep coming back to this mate thing? And I, at that time, I didn't know because I was like not really doing, doing mates. But then I learned as you sort of have a great cleaning um, 
you just kind of want it like every week. I'm like, oh, this is nice because you don't have to do anything. I was like, oh, you'll do the laundry, you'll do your dishes, you'll do everything. I was like, oh, this is nice. I mean, I just got a cleaning today and I was like, oh, this feels nice. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's very cool. So you, you ran that business for, for a little while. I think it was less than two years until you moved on to the next thing. So talk about that. You have a business that's working um, and then you ended up deciding to, to go move on to something else. How did that decision happen? Yeah, so that comp- so Mater is running. It's still I still own the company. Basically, what happened was uh, my brother joined, and he came. Uh, my brother was like an investment banker, and he's like, "Oh, I want to do something." I was like, and he's like, "Oh, just come join me, and you know, I'm kind of like help me run the stuff." And he was kind of always helping me behind the scenes, like finances, just thinking about things, contracts, um, LLCs, all this stuff. Like he was good at. Um, I'm like I'm not I'm not good at a lot of things, and my brother helps me out with a lot of that stuff that I don't really deal with accounting all this stuff. He like finds the right people for us. Hmm. Um, so then I was like, Oh, Edwin, do you like want to run it for me? And he's like, yeah, well, cool. I'll run it. And obviously like the best thing I did was give it to him. Like the company has grown so much bigger that he has run it. Um, uh, obviously you probably can tell by me, like, I'm like, think of random things. I was like, he was like completely added structure to everything. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, he's just like, Kevin, why are your employees going to the gym? At, like 12 o'clock. I mean, I was like, I don't know. I like, that's a good perk for them. Like, nah, like no one's going to the gym anymore at 12. I was like, everybody's working nine to five. It was like very, like, if I look back at the stuff I've done, I was like, we laugh about it now. I'm just like, wow, it's so crazy. Like that we did that. Uh, yeah, but I'm like, curious, this is, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I'm curious when you handed it off to your brother, how much revenue were you guys doing? Cause you said you grew significantly after that. Oh, we were, we were still doing about 3 million and he grew it much more than that. Right now we're doing much more than that. And the thing with Edwin that he get, came on board was like the structure but also we were, we were thinking about more about expanding um, the company. So that's when we started acquiring other businesses. Because for me, I was like, I was like he was telling me, he's like, Kevin, you're really good at SEO. Like, like, and we're getting all this traffic through, through Google. He's like, what if we acquire all the other companies that are on like top three? Like what happens? Do we like just get all the clicks? I was like, yeah, essentially we do, right? <laughs> so then we started like, obviously like the top three ones, but also like, it's like more backstory to that. Like, uh, all the maid companies eventually like kind of knew each other. So we were going out to dinner, like hanging out, like, Hey, what are you guys thinking about? Like acquisition? How are you guys doing? So like, we kind of like, I mean, like anybody in the space that you kind of like know each other. And it wasn't like, I always tell people like, I think it's already naive to be like, Oh, don't talk to your competitors. But like a lot of times, like we acquired our companies because it was a competitor. And then I called him one, one day and I was like, Hey, like, I'm thinking about going to Chicago. Like, I'm just curious. Did you want to sell a company? He's like, Oh, actually I do. And it's like, all right, let's talk numbers. And that's sort of like why it's so helpful to have industry contracts that are in the same space, because it's not just talking about issues you're having, but like potentially like anybody, you kind of like sometimes get bored or you run, you don't want to do it anymore. And it's like, Oh, Hey, like you'll go to the person, you know, um, even now his name is Donald. I was talking to him two weeks ago. I was like, Hey, like, he's like, Hey, we should do like a mastermind of like made companies. Cause there's so many made companies. Like, it's like, Kevin, you have like one of the biggest companies in New York city. I'm pretty sure people want to talk to you. But I was like, oh, I don't know. It's like, just do it. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's try it. So, <laughs> yeah. so. I love it. you're, you're a yes man. And you, you love, uh, you love saying yes to ideas. Okay. So you, you handed off the company to your brother who, who you could trust, of course. And he ended up um, growing it from there, which is awesome. And then you ended up starting an ad agency. So talk about how you got into this game because it's a competitive game. There's a ton of agencies out there. You guys specialize uh, in in Facebook marketing and and I'm sure SEO as well, since that's your forte. But what gave you the idea of jumping into this competitive market? Why did you you think you were going to succeed in it? Yeah. So after the made sellers, what I did was I was doing, I think I was telling you, I was doing, uh, I wanted to do e-commerce because service-based businesses is great. A great business model um, just because you kind of, uh, only pay people when you sort of uh, have business. So there's like low upfront costs as in like, if you think about like capital, but the next business that I did uh, was an e-commerce company because FBA at the time was really big. And I was listening to like all these podcasts about FBA, like the amazing seller um, by Scott Volker at that time was like massive. And I was like, Whoa, like these guys are making so much money on FBA. Like I need to be doing that. And then I was like, this, people were like, this is so scalable. Uh, you can make more money. You just go to Alibaba, AliExpress, get stuff from, from China. Um, and then you do that. And at the time, my friend Wilson, I've mentioned him a few times, but he was doing this for the hammocks and he was telling me how much money he was making. I was like, Whoa, I was like, Wilson, like you got to help me do something. And like, I was like, I was like, dude, we were like live together we're roommates. I was like, we got to do this together. And then he's just like, and then he helped me find products uh, to source. And I was like, so he was doing outdoor and I was like, I'm going to do outdoor. And he's like, don't do outdoors. I was like, no, I'm going to do outdoors. He's like, I, and I was like, I was like, Wilson, think about it. I was like, you have an email list. I get an email list. Then we can cross sell. And he's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So this is like where like, just like my marketing 
stuff thinking about it. I was like, oh, like mate sellers, we're selling, we're, we're, we're emailing customers discounts, coupons, and we're making so much money from that because every time we're like, oh yeah, I got a book again. Um, I was like, oh, let's do that. So then he helped me uh, do my outdoor gear company. And that's kind of how I learned Amazon, FBA. And I was telling you before, I went to like China like three times. I went to like Canton Fair. Uh, I went to factories in Taiwan just to sort of meet our, meet our manufacturers. And that really uh, met, led me to learn e-commerce in general. And that was like a thing where you learn Google ads, Facebook ads. Um, I just, so I did that. And then that led me to start, I was doing that for about a year and a half. And then basically what happened with that company was another guy that was working for me for Matesars wanted to sort of leave. And I was like, oh no, I don't want you to leave because he was really good because he had like a really good mind. He was really smart, a college dropout too, but just a really smart person. I was like, I want you to run the outdoor gear company. And then he then went and run it. And that was like after a year and a half. And now he has his own employees, his own like assistant running it. And I'm just like, he just comes to us for like ideas every week. I'm like, hey, what do you guys think about this? Is the strategy we're going to do? And I'm like, okay, great, go do it. Um, for me, I was like, probably see, like, I'm fine letting things go because I want to move on to like the next thing. Whereas like, I think some people are like, oh, I want to hold on for it. I'm like, no, nah, like I'm going to think about ideas. I want somebody else to like run it like a pro and, and make it better. Uh, so that led me to then start Chester, which is our luggage company. Um, and Chester was kind of like a combination of like all the stuff I learned from the outdoor gear company um, because I was like, oh, this product is so easily. Anyways, for the outdoor gear company, a company's called Montem, by the way, like Wirecutter and New York Times, we're like the number one trucking pole because our product is so good. So we got a lot of review sites, a great product. We beat like Black Diamond and Lucky, which is our two biggest competitors. Uh, we still can't get into REI because Black Diamond and Lucky have like, like this sort of like, I don't know, deal with them. And we keep saying like, hey, look, we're better than them. They're like, no, you're not getting into it. I was like, oh, so frustrating. <laughs> uh, but even for that company, we did like a lot of marketing, like sales calls. We did uh, cold outreach, cold emails. Uh, we went to events too. So I went to like Denver to pitch at like outdoor gear events. Uh, we did a lot of cold email to local stores. Uh, great tactic here that I did for this company was because like people were just like not responding to us. So we made a list of like all the, all like the outdoor places in, in like every single state. So what we would do is like had other employees from my make made company, I would like call the company and say like, Hey, you want Montem poles? And they're going to say, no, like, Oh man, that sucks. And then the next week call again, another person. And then we would call saying, Hey, we have, we're Montem outdoor gear. Do you guys want trading poles? Like, Oh yeah. People have been calling about you guys. Oh yeah. That's what that makes sense. Yeah. Because we're growing brand. And then like, they're like, so then we're like, that's how we got like POs. And then we're like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. So POs is like a, like purchase order essentially. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that Jay-Z used a similar tactic to promote his first album, going to album <laughs> stores and asking to buy it and they didn't have it. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, it's like, it's like, for me, it's like, it's, I read like these tactics. I'm like, how do I, like any tactic that you read, it's like, how can you apply that to your business in a way that makes sense? Um, because it's just tactics and, and people sometimes like figuring out like, what is the right one for your business? I'm like, Oh, there's so many, you just got to figure out how to apply it. Like this tactic works for any business, you know? So it doesn't really uh, matter. Like, so. Uh, but that, that's what we did for that. And then I started Chester, which is my other e-commerce company, because at that time we saw the luggage space was kind of booming. And then we learned from stuff. We're like, oh, if we sell like a bigger product, it's less easy to copy because it requires more capital. And also it's like, it's more expensive to ship. And then by this time, we were already working with better factories. Um, by this time too, uh, I was, what was that thing? Like we were working with better factories. We knew more contacts. So that led us to finding better suppliers because our supplier for the out outdoor gear company helped us find another one for the luggage one. And then that one's, that one was really good because they could, they would, they, we'd be like, Oh, make this thing for us. And you're like, no, like we need schematics and we need CAD drawings. And remember my, my brother, he was actually an architect in college. So he's like, Oh, I'll do that for you guys. And then he did it. So then like, you gotta use the resources. I was like, so he did all the drawings. We worked with like the YKK factory. If you look at Chester travels, everything on the luggage is custom, custom zippers, custom lining, custom storage everything on there is like, we made it the shells our own sort of uh, mold as well. And so the, the handles, the way we make it's completely uh, custom, which is nice, uh, cost more money, of course. Uh, but that's sort of how we were able to do that. And for Chester, I think last year before like Corona, essentially we were doing like $2 million a year that was through Amazon and through our website. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just because of all the stuff that we've kind of learned before. And I mean, like, I mean, I didn't know I was going to need to use that, but like when you think about it, it's like, Oh, this is, this makes sense now. So. Interesting. Um, and by the way, folks, we have about 15 minutes or so left to go here. If you're listening to this recording, uh, we are doing this live. And um, if the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to drop that into the chat. I'm curious, Kevin, you know, at this point, how many companies are you? Well, I know that you're not running all of them, but how many companies do you have your hands in right now? And what's your, what are you spending most of your time on? So right, so right now, most of my time goes into Voy Media. So 
that company right now, we have about 23 employees and our plan is to grow that to Q3, Q2 of 2021 to 50. So right now we're actually hiring like a director, or like the agency to come in and essentially be like, okay, like come in and help us run it. Cause like, that's sort of where the point is right now. Uh, so that's sort of where 90% of my time is. That's because I do a lot of the sales calls. Uh, uh, and that sort of goes back to kind of like you were saying before, like why Boy Media or so sort of like why an agency? And really it came from just all this previous experience that I've had. And then I had to learn actual proper sales. So I took a lot of sales training. Like anything I do, uh, eventually like I always go to courses or coaches. I think it's probably one of the best things that people can do is do coaches or courses when you don't like really know um, kind of do things. Because I was like, oh, like my friend was like, listen to my calls because I record all the calls on Zoom. He's like, oh, like he's like, you're selling because you're knowledgeable. but like you can be much better if you like say the right tactics. So then that led me to start like actually go to like a speech coach in, the, in, in New York City. Uh, I went to him twice a week and then I did another public speaking class every Friday night in New York City. Um, this, for my speech coach, people are curious, is really great guy, Brian Loxley. Um, like really, really uh, uh, was like, Kevin, you're saying the words like this, like you're obviously I'm still, probably still now. He's like, you're saying your word too fast. He's like, you're not pronouncing, pronouncing this right. And it's like crazy. Like I was like, Oh my God, like, I don't even know any of that stuff, but like he would make me record it and watch it. And we would, he would make me stand up and say things. And, um, but yeah, I, that's all. I took a tons and tons of courses. I had to get better at sales. Um, because like I said, my friend was like, you just know your stuff. But like, again, like, um, they go to you because like, you're like a friendly person and you, you know what you're doing. You have the, the accolades that you can do that. But that's sort of like why uh, I did it because of that sort of thing that I, that I saw uh, other agencies didn't have. And I was like, oh, I can come in with that pure sort of experience. And that came from just me through life. Like when I was working at other companies, I would see some of the agencies that I worked with and I was like Googling them. Cause like, I don't know. I, I just like Google things. I was like, Oh, who's this guy? And I was like, Google them. I was like, Oh, they have a Twitter. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. And I was like, Oh, this guy doesn't really have experience. So I was like, Oh, interesting how they're hiring him. I was like, okay. So I was like, and then that sort of like came into my mind. I was like, Oh, I can do that. Um, but that's sort of, uh, that's kind of started it. And now, uh, like I said, we're just growing the agency and of course uh, that just like different funnels and, and tactics. And of course we focus a lot of e-commerce, but digital products is like uh, the new thing that I'm kind of excited about now. Mm, very cool. Well, um, you know, first of all, friendliness can go a long way. People do buy from people they like, and there's all sorts of different types of personalities when it comes to salespeople, yeah. as well as leaders, of course. And, um, uh, you know, being knowledgeable, does, being a domain expert can help you generate business, obviously, but of course you can refine it. And it sounds like you just go deep in any topic yeah. that interests you. But the other thing that clearly is a main takeover for me from this episode is you're not afraid to try new things. And most people, when they come across something new, whether it's a new skill they're trying to pick up or a new idea that they want to test, there's a lot of trepidation. There's a lot of fear. What if I fail? What if it doesn't work out? For you, it sounds like that's missing. I don't know what, if, yeah. you know, it's like a gene that's missing, but you don't seem to care. You just kind of jump into the deep end of the pool, figure out if it works. Does, you don't really mind if it's not refined. You know that in the, you, if need be, you will hire somebody that can sort of operationalize yeah. it and create structure. And, and then the, the thing is like that sort of like people always ask me like, oh, why aren't you afraid? And I always think back to sort of how I grew up because my parents came from El Salvador when they were like 17, not knowing any English. And they raised us and they bought a house in New York, New York. And they're like, and I was looking back at them and I'm just like, whoa, like, the, like they came to the U.S. not knowing anything, but they came here for a better opportunity of life and they gave it to us. And I remember once I was in California, I went and it was like, like nine o'clock or something at night there. And I called my mom crying because I was like upset. I was like walking like Market Street. And I was like, I don't like it here. Like, I don't know anybody. Like, I'm just not good. And she was just like, pretty much in Spanish. Like, like Kevin, like, this is the dream you wanted. Like, I came to the United States. This was not my dream. Like, I came here because of just what I had to do to survive. And I was like, whoa, like, that really is like the difference. Like, like, I'm doing this because like, this is what I want. Like, why am I not chasing it and giving the chance that I fail? I can always go back home and for like i think my parents like they couldn't go back home they had to stay here and stick it out and them showing us that stuff uh really uh made me just be like well okay like i could just do whatever i want like and, and so that sort of like helped me sort of think about things because like uh, this is my dream like this is their dream and i'm like i want to do it for them too so uh, my mom gets excited so she likes it huh. That's awesome. Um, that, that's awesome that you have that support network and your family understands you and your personality. And, you know, you knew you could always go back, um, which I think is, is so great. A lot, of, a lot of people don't have that. And yeah. if you don't have that, you know, seek that out, find people that will support 
your crazy ideas. You were telling me earlier this morning that you have one roommate where you give you tell oh, him yeah. an idea and he's like, that's never going to work. Yeah, and you stop going to that guy for, for yeah. ideas because you end up finding out that, that somebody else built a successful business doing that. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, yeah. My roommate Adam, I love him, but like, yeah, I was like, Adam, me and Wilson, like Adam, we're never telling you ideas again. He's like, sorry guys, I'm just a startup guy like you guys. You guys are risk takers. I was like, oh my god, Adam, like Jesus Christ, I could have had a million dollar idea, and uh, we just, we, I saw him like last year, and we just laugh about it. Yeah, I mean, you're a risk taker, but at the same time, they're, they're calculated risks. You 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 essentially figure out how to run experiments quickly, and I think that's another takeaway for me here. If you if you know how to build product. You know, why not just build stuff and see if it works? But what you learned pretty quickly after trying it a bunch of times in your in your 20s, in your early 20s, is that actually the marketing stuff is the hardest. So for most people, if you're not an engineer or if you're not good at building product, don't spend six months or a year yeah. building a product. Figure out the marketing side first and the demand side first and then build a product if, you're, if, you, if you can't spin up technologies as fast yeah. as as Kevin and his team can, because it's, it's not, everybody should follow a, a, a different strategy depending on their own skills, I think. Um, Janice, we, we do have a, a question that came in and Janice asked a question, uh, what process do you put in place to control uh, variation or to ensure some consistency? Because, you know, I think at kind of hearing your story, it seems like it's a little bit of a free for all, right? I mean, you, 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 you probably yeah, yeah. have a lot of autonomy in your business and you let people kind of do their own thing. But especially when you're starting off, if you don't have that operational person, that structured person that's running the business yet, uh, what processes do you put in place to make sure that there's actually output and consistency on the team? Yeah, I think a lot of it in the beginning, a lot of it, uh, at least for me, had to do with just, I guess with any startup when you're like maybe two or three people, you're kind of always working together. So when you sort of see what, I, I mean, back then it was like not remote as it is now, at least for back then it was kind of like, everybody was kind of like aligned with the goal of like what you wanted to do. Like you knew, like at least for May company it was like, Hey, we're trying to make this thing to something. We have to work as hard as we can in order to make it work. Like we're all not getting paid a lot of money. We're all just like trying to figure out how to get the next booking. We're all trying to figure out how to get the next uh, cleaner, uh, how to get the, it's like, we're all in this goal together. So that really helped out and sort of like just being aligned and like the people you hired and like, this is like what I'm trying to do. Like, come and come with me for the ride. It's more of like that aspirational thing that you need to give that employees the first few, because even for, even now, like uh, the guys I hired over five years ago are still with me because they're still with like, they're still driving. Like, uh, yeah, my first employees are still with me uh, that I hired over five years ago. Um, and it's more of like that sort of, they would see me working, they would see my Edwin working and they're like, oh, whoa, like I got to work too, which is like not the best way. But then, but then after it's sort of like a process or like, for example, for Hawaii Media, we, everything is like a checklist of Asana. We have a process for how to onboard. We have processes for how to interview people. We have process for everything. So that's how, that's eventually, that's kind of how you maintain quality. It's like, you actually have to read like operational books and read like OKRs about like John Doerr, like measure what matters is a good book. So, yeah, I love that. And you, you obviously also read a lot when you're curious about a topic, you dive deep, but then you don't, you don't only read, you actually figure out how do I apply this immediately? Most people read a ton of stuff and then they don't yeah. apply it and then they forget it. And it's very, you know, it's kind of useless when you consume oh, yeah. knowledge and then you just only to forget it. So make sure that you read things at the right time when you need them so you can apply them immediately. And I guess my last question, because, you know, you did start this agency, you learned marketing by yourself, you learned SEO, you learned, uh, you know, digital advertising and the like. And I'm curious if, if you were to start right now on a clean slate and you didn't know much about marketing, you didn't know much about sales, how would you start? What would you recommend people listening to the show or here live uh, at the seminar do if they want to go deep and learn about marketing now in 2020? Uh, what I would say they would do is I think YouTube is a great sort of place to learn some sort of marketing stuff. But honestly, uh, some of the great stuff that you can learn at, I was, so people always ask me like how I learned marketing. I always tell people like when I was doing SEO, for example, I always tell people like, think about what are the hardest industries for whatever thing you're trying to do. Like for example, SEO, I was like, think about the hardest industries that are there to rank for SEO, because you know that if you want to get to the top 10, it requires true SEO expertise. Um, so for example, for SEO, I would say, look at the industries where Google doesn't allow you to advertise, because if it doesn't allow you to advertise, that means that all you can only do SEO. For example, that's Viagra, sex, pills, porn. There's no ads for that. And that means the guys ranking top three actually need to know SEO versus the guys that are doing like the super white hat stuff, like candy, like anybody can, anybody can do that. And that's not exciting, but go to the industries where, you know, there's a lot of money and try to reverse engineer how those guys are doing it because that will teach you stuff. Um, so anything it's about 
thinking how that, what that is. Same thing with like, let's say you're doing e-commerce. Anybody can, if, you, if you're a VC funded startup and you can go, you can do Facebook ads, they're gonna spend a ton of money. They don't really care about CAC, right? Go to the industries that are not VC funded and see how they're doing marketing because they need to make sure that they're making profit every dollar or else you're gonna run out of cash. Um, so think about like, what are you wanna do and sort of who's doing it the hard way and you wanna go and do that. Uh, that's right, that's how I learned. I always go to the, that's how I just like try to, I tell people just reverse engineer. Um, which is the best it's kind of like, and I guess that comes from just programming because that's what I was like, Oh, I'm gonna do a program. I want to see how I make it. So that's sort of like, uh, how I think about it in marketing too. You no, know, I love that. And we actually have several examples of people doing that on the show. You know, you mentioned how years ago you were trying to figure out business opportunity. You looked at Google, Google keyword trends yeah. to see what are people searching for and where maybe are there lower bids for advertising that you could find an opportunity, um, to actually create a product and sell it where there's not a lot of competition. You did the same thing with your luggage company where you saw that on Amazon, there wasn't a lot of people, maybe no one really selling luggage at the time. And you found out the reason was because it's actually expensive to produce. And you had some capital from your previous business. You ended up launching that and finding a niche there. So finding opportunities by doing research ahead of time um, is a great way to figure out what businesses to start. But then, you know, what we talked about this current theme of just curiosity and learning about concepts by reading books, watching YouTube videos, et cetera, but then immediately applying them to the ideas that you have. And by the way, doesn't matter if you build a super successful business from it, you can use that experience to then leverage to get a great job somewhere. People love it when you work on your side projects and you learn on your own because then they'll know you'll be able to own processes for them when you join their companies. I love that. I love your story, Kevin. I really appreciate you sharing how you built your businesses and how you've thought about your career. I, I feel like you're just going to be starting companies for the rest of your life because it's almost like a hobby for you. I, I, I see you were smiling yeah. this entire episode. I have a new company that's starting up, like that's going to launch soon. It's like a supplement space. So yeah, there you we go. Were, yeah, we were working second. with like, uh, we were working with like the FDA to get the label approved. So that's like another thing. I never talked, I never worked with the FDA. I'm like, oh, I'll just figure it out. Like, it can't be that hard. Like, yeah. And then you find out, of course, usually things are a little bit harder than you thought in the beginning, but ignorance yeah. is bliss uh, yeah. when it comes to starting businesses. Uh, Kevin Urtia of Void Media, thank you so much for coming on The Mentors and sharing your story. Uh, it was really great to hear. Love your enthusiasm and energy, and hopefully uh, you guys all enjoyed this conversation. Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. And I did drop the survey link. Uh, if you can just provide your feedback, we would love you forever and also send you the video recording. That's school16.co forward slash survey. Thanks so much, Kevin. Had a great rest of your day. And everybody else, thank you for joining us today live. And we'll see you, some of you, next week. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Kevin.